yesterday with Nancy Pelosi and Senator Schumer, and uh, it was a very bipartisan meeting. The compromise is that, not dictating what should happen, but working together. I was very proud of uh, uh, the Senate minority and uh, Senate Democratic leader. Chuck Schumer, he, he could speak New York to the president. Chuck Schumer, whose title is minority leader, not majority leader, just made himself the most powerful man in America for the month of December. This is an embarrassing moment for a Republican-controlled Congress and a Republican administration. The yeas are 80, the nays are 17. Well, the vote this afternoon, the Senate passing this debt ceiling raise, the continuing resolution and funding for Harvey, of course, now goes to the House. Also today, the president tweeted out uh, this morning a clarification saying for all those DACA, uh, the dreamers, if you will, that are concerned about your status during the six month period, you have nothing to worry about, no action. And then we got the play by play about why that happened. When he called this morning, I said, thanks for calling. This is what we need. People really need a reassurance from, from you, Mr. President, that um, uh, the six-month period is not a period of roundup. But I asked the president to do, and boom, 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 the tweet appeared. Boom, boom, boom. And Chuck Schumer was speaking New York to him. What about all this? Let's bring in our panel. Tom Bevan, Real Clear Politics co-founder and publisher, editor-in-chief of Life Set, Laura Ingram, and Michael Crowley, senior foreign affairs correspondent for Politico. All right, Laura, um, obviously there's some conservatives up there on the Hill uh, who have real concerns about this and think that this deal puts them in a tough spot come December. Where were they for the last seven weeks? You know, to hear Ben Sass and all these people turning themselves inside and out, Mitch McConnell looks like, you know, lost his best friend. What did they think was going to happen? They kept telling Donald Trump for several months that, don't worry, this is a really complex process, this Obamacare repeal, but we got it. Then they said, wait, we, we, we almost have it on the skinny repeal. It's not as good, but it's going to be pretty good. Turns out McCain comes in, he blows the whole thing up. Time after time after time, Donald Trump trusted what was going on in Capitol Hill. They could not deliver a piece of legislation to his desk that actually could be signed. It wasn't possible. So what does someone who's a conservative populist do when he wants to move the ball down the field? He's going to find, okay, what other player can I throw to? And the only one who was on the field at the time for him was going to be Nancy Pelosi and uh, Chuck Schumer. But the Republicans have no one to blame but themselves on this. Right. And here's what they say behind the scenes up on the Hill is that uh, he took the first offer. Uh, they, he blindsided them. And now come December, as you heard in that soundbite, uh, Chuck Schumer and the Democrats have a chip to play in the negotiations of whatever's happening, tax reform, whatever thing is happening with another fiscal cliff. It may be their fault, but this is the position they're in. It is. And look, Trump was very clear. He did want a bipartisan win. And But the problem is, and to Laura's point, no one to trust. I mean, 48 hours ago, Nancy Pelosi was calling him a political coward over the DACA decision. Okay? If he thinks this is some new bipartisan moment here, um, I think he's going to be sadly mistaken. The first time he steps out of line, doesn't get Democrats what they want, they're going to be back to calling him a racist or a white nationalist or whatever. So I just think, I, I think Republicans have to hope this was a one-off. Um, and that he is back in line with them. Otherwise, I, I don't think anything's going to get done. Michael. Well, and to your point, Tom, you know, this poisons the well going forward. Now Republicans in Congress are never going to know when Trump might sell them out, when he might set them up telling them one thing on Monday and do something else on Tuesday. Uh, uh, and certainly, you know, if you imagine sort of a worst case scenario for Trump, the Russia investigation uh, deepens and widens and there's some movement for impeachment, Democrats are not going to be there defending him. Uh, so Republicans uh, really, I think, I mean, this is really, of all the surreal plot twists in the Trump presidency, this is really one of the big ones. But I, I guess the final point I would make is that you can remember Steve Bannon, uh, early in the Trump administration, was talking about a populist coalition that would involve working closely with Democrats, for instance, on something like a uh, major infrastructure project. And I think the Bannon vision, uh, which is sort of Trumpism to me, uh, isn't partisan. It actually kind of grabs Democrats and Republicans and puts them together in a new coalition. Now, I don't know if we're actually seeing the beginning of that, but there is a sort of a predicate to this kind of thing. And again, it goes back to the question of whether Republicans like Mitch McConnell uh, or Paul Ryan should really trust oh, Donald so, Trump. So the politics, though, we are, we were talking about the Republican side and the right and conservatives having a problem. But on the Democratic side, there are actually some people on the left, especially the populist left or the farther left, who say, don't get too close to this president. Remember, this is the bad guy. And when they start making deals, do they have a, some kind of problem from the left? 
I think there is some problem from the left. Look I, at Diane Feinstein the other day, who says maybe he has a chance of being an okay president, right. and she had to put out she three had to walk in statements to say, you know, I wasn't. She had to walk it back, and there was a lot of alarm about that initial, as I said, the Bannon vision involving infrastructure. There was a lot of pressure on Schumer in particular. Mm -hmm. Don't chum up with your New York buddy. You're going to be hearing more of that. This isn't the Bannon vision. This is the Trump vision. He campaigned as a populist, a conservative populist. Uh, I have a book coming out on this in October. Every president has had a, a populist moment. And it, going from Reagan to even Clinton, Obama had a little populism. And now we have a president and it, who's, who's up against the wall here. He is. We've got two natural disasters. Seven times they voted to repeal Obamacare. They could not deliver a bill. So these guys were well, you don't ineffective. Have, you don't have a problem with the DACA statement saying, I got your back even if Congress doesn't pass a law? Substantively, that is not where I am. But Donald Trump did not run on deporting the DACA kids. Remember what he ran on. He ran on rescinding DACA. How many other of the Republican candidates who ran for president, other than maybe uh, Santorum, would have voted, would have said, no, Doc, we're not, I'm not, we're rescinding it. It's over in six months. I don't think any of them, Jeb, Marco, they all would have uh, let, the, let the DACA kids stay. So this idea that, oh, well, Donald Trump, how could he do this? He's doing what he thinks is the right thing at the right time. Americans are sick of the Republicans. 15% approval but for Laura, Mitch McConnell and Paul only, Ryan The only right problem now. is if they're sick of the Republicans come 2018 and they lose, if Democrats have gavel control of these committees, it's not a good thing. Well, well, president, it's not, well look, if they don't get tax reform through by early December, not Christmas Eve, but early December, mid mid November. It's done anyway. What are I they going to talk about? One more on? thing. Uh, Washington Post headline: Tom uh, Trump Schumer agreed to pursue plan to repeal the debt ceiling as far as the vote overall. Uh, here is an interview I did before he got in the race uh, back in 2015. We owe 18 trillion dollars. We're going to 21 trillion and ultimately 24, which is a magic word. You know, 24 trillion, that's the magic number. That's like the point of no return. And we're there very quickly. We're going to end up being another Greece, and maybe we're going to end up being another Detroit, because that's where our country is going. We need proper leadership. But you don't hear the concern about the debt and the deficit now. No, you don't. And you heard it from him on other issues, right, on Social Security, entitlements. He hasn't been uh, very strict on it. It's a pretty amazing transformation. If you think backward to where the Tea Party started, it was all about ideological purity on spending, no bailouts, all of that, which drove this Republican wave. And now we have a president who is very much a pragmatist, right, Republican, Democrat. He wants to get something done. And he doesn't have those same ideological moorings around issues like debt and deficit. He's and not so a libertarian. He's not a libertarian. Libertarians can't win national elections. Yeah, but he